Well, a very warm welcome to everybody here today. Anyone um, still at home on their sofas? Um, I got a few notices for you before we um, get into praying and praising God. Uh, there's a prayer meeting tonight, normal time, 6.30 on Zoom. I think it's still on Zoom, isn't it? We're not yet meeting in person, yet. Uh, the youth group's slightly different, though. Um, on Monday, that will be meeting, if you haven't had, if you're a parent and you've got children, uh, it will be at the Snell, in the Snellers Garden, unless it's raining, and then you'll get a message saying it needs to go back on Zoom. So it's a flexible one. Hopefully, it'll be outside. Um, the person organising the game for that night is going to be in trouble because they're going to have to switch their game from outside to Zoom. But there we go. Um, and we've got refreshments now. So after the service, there's refreshments. So don't stay in here. Um, gather outside. I think it's still groups of 30. So maybe we have two groups. Two groups um, outside and, and get your refreshments out there. Okay. Uh, but we're here, aren't we, to praise the living God. Uh, to lift up our voices. Well, we can't lift up our voices because we're not allowed yet, but we're nearly allowed, it, hopefully soon, if they lock down, or oh, they stop locking down, which we don't know yet. But if they do, we can actually sing, which is something to look forward to. Uh, but we, we can praise God uh, with our hearts, and we can hum. So there we go. Um, but hopefully that this madness is over soon. Um, let, I'm going to read to you from Daniel chapter 2. Verse 20, this is what Daniel says about God. Uh, Blessed be the, God, the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. What does God do? He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. And that's the God who he prays, the God who knows all things. He even knows what's in the darkness, yet he is light, and we're here to praise him today. So if you'll join me in prayer, uh, we will pray to him. Dear Lord God, we thank you that after our weeks where perhaps we haven't thought about you an awful lot, we would ask forgiveness when we've done that that we would fix our minds now on you, God. You are the God who is the creator, the sustainer, the one who knows all things, who's worthy of all our praise. Lord, you are the God who loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us, and that anyone who has faith in him is saved. And there's many people in this room who have been saved by putting their faith in you. And so we are joyful, Lord, and so thrilled that we can praise you this morning, be thankful to you for your salvation, that you've saved us. Thank you that we can look forward to an eternity with you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the real and living God, and we want to praise you this morning. So though we can't sing, Lord, would our hearts sing out to you? Uh, and we do pray that these restrictions would be lifted soon so that we can pr sing properly to you. And Lord, we do pray that um, as John comes to speak later, um, that we would listen carefully and we would hear your words in your scriptures and we would come to know you in a, with a deeper relationship than we have already. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to have a song to that God, come people of the risen King. So please stand up when the song come, um, happens, hum along and... Yeah.
John comes up to do his children's talk, I want to do a book recommendation. We don't do too many of these here. It'd be great if we did more and more. Um, and if you don't know where to go to get Christian books, there's a couple of good websites. So tenofthose.com is really good. Um, there's a good book company. Any others that I miss? You can even get them on Amazon. So uh, I got this on Amazon, actually. So that's pretty bad of me. Um, but uh, this is a book that I've, I've only read half of it. So you wouldn't normally recommend the book that you've read half of, but it's already so good that I have to recommend it to everyone. So it's called Providence by John Piper, and I know already a lot of you will be put off because it's so big, um, but you shouldn't be. Uh, it's got big writing in it, and uh, the chapters go very quickly. And what it's about is he, um, John Piper, there's loads of Bible verses in it. It's full of Bible verses, and what um, he does is he goes through the whole Bible, and he shows how God is sovereign in everything and providential in everything and and he backs it all up by scripture so if you want sort of like an overview of what the bible says about how god's hand is over everything over the birds over the uh the water in the sea over storms over bacteria over the devil and there's chapter after chapter where he he doesn't just tell you this he then takes you to all the different verses in the bible and you can go through them and you can go and check everything he says is what he's saying true and he'll give you about 15 different verses. And you go, wow, God is suffering here and there. And, and it's called Providence, he says, because he, he, went, he went out to make a book about um, so God's sovereignty. And he ended up calling it Providence because you can't talk about God's sovereignty without seeing that God is a providential God, that he has a plan for everything. And so the whole of creation, the whole of everything he's created is all created to, to glorify him. And it's an amazing, amazing book. So um, it's something that I thought I would recommend to you guys if you can get hold of. It wasn't expensive. Um, I think mine was under 20 pounds. 
So if you can get it as cheap as that, that's great. Um, I don't know how much it is now because I pre-ordered it. Um, but um, get hold of that if you can, and it's really good. Anyway, John's going to come up and do a children's talk for us. Great, thank you, Chris. Right, so uh, I wonder what you're like when you get good news. When you receive good news, maybe it's uh, you've just been told about your summer holiday plans, and so you're telling all your friends at school, I'm going here for holiday. Or uh, maybe it's about your birthday party. I've just found out what I'm going to do for my birthday. And you tell everybody about it. Uh, When we get good news, we do want to tell people, don't we? We get excited. It overflows. The excitement overflows. And we want to tell people about that good news, that exciting news. Well, a few years ago, um, when Ruth and I were very young, uh, and uh, we were a couple of years married, uh, we found out that uh, Ruth was pregnant. And it was really exciting, really exciting, good news. It was the first time she was pregnant, and we were really excited. And so we phoned our parents, and we told them, because we were just overflowing. We just found out, but we were just overflowing. We had to tell someone. So we phoned our parents. We said, Ruth's pregnant. We're going to have our our first child. It's really exciting. And we said, but we we, want to tell people in our own time. Please don't tell anyone. Um, You know, we're excited, but we just want to hold back from telling people at the moment. So if you could just keep it to yourselves. Well, anyway, the next day I spoke to my dad. My dad is, is not renowned for keeping secrets. Uh, and he had walked into his job as a teacher that day, and the first person he saw was a caretaker, and he told them. It, it, was just, it just came out. He was so excited about this good news. He's going to be a granddad for the first time, and it just flew out. The first person he saw, caretaker, then the receptionist. I don't know, but he said, I'm really sorry, John, I've got to tell you. It just came out. I was just so excited by this good news. Uh, so if you, want, never, if you want a secret, help, never tell my dad, okay? But that's what happens, isn't it? And that's what we see in the book of Acts as the gospel, this best news, the best news in the whole world that Jesus has saved us from this sinful world, from our own sin, so that we can come back into relationship with God. The best news ever, it should flow out from us. And we see that in the early church. It just flows out. Wherever they go, they talk about this good news because they're excited. It's overflowing. Now, There are some places around the world where you're just not allowed to talk about the gospel, though. And they find that in the early church, where they go, they're being told, you can't talk about this. You know, this can't come out of you so freely. You've got to stop. And we might find ourselves in that situation, where we've got this good news, and people around us are saying, you can't share that good news. But what we're seeing in the book of Acts, and it's this repeated storyline over and over again, wherever they go, they just can't stop. Even if they're told you are not to talk about this, it just overflows. Like my dad, who got so excited by that good news, it just overflows. And that's why we have this book of Acts. It repeats the same thing over and over again so that we can be encouraged and excited to see the power of God's word. As, they, as people hear it, they are saved. And why would we want to hold back such good news from people? Well, let's pray that we would be encouraged this morning as we go out to our groups or if we're staying in here, as we hear about the message of the book of Acts, that it would overflow, this good news would overflow from us in our families, in our communities, and out to the ends of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your word we find the greatest news the whole world has ever heard. Lord, we pray that as we go from here today, we would be so excited that the first person we see, we would want to tell them. We we pray, Lord, that your, your spirit would be at work in us and we would see the power of your word to save And so we would be bold to speak of you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have another song now. Uh, And as the song begins, if you're leading Sunday school, please do head out, uh, get yourselves ready. Once the song is finished, Chris will come and direct uh, different families to go out uh, as uh, socially distanced.
guys want to go and then I'll work my way around and you guys move you can start going out yeah do you want you guys next go on yeah grace and then you guys over there how I missed anyone I'm, I think that's everyone okay now Mike and Scylla are going to come up and pray for us before you this morning as a company of your people and we're so grateful this morning that you are our heavenly father oh lord we praise you and worship you because we can know that you are the creator of this universe and that lord you sent the lord jesus christ that we might know our sins forgiven and eternity in heaven oh lord this morning we do know that we have said and done and thought things throughout this week which will not be pleasing to you but we know lord that you are a faithful merciful forgiving god and lord that you can forgive us of our sin and wrong lord your mercy is towards us anew every morning and your compassions fail not oh lord we would long that others around this area in leatherhead and about would come to know of the love of jesus and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to be bold in sharing the gospel with our friends, our relatives, and those of our neighbours, that, Lord, others may want to hear the gospel. Oh, Lord, help us to be useful to you in sharing the gospel. We thank you for these wonderful messages from the book of Acts, where your gospel is unstoppable. And we ask, Lord, that through this area where we live, you will be gracious and shed this unstoppable gospel that, Lord, this area might be known as an area which is touched by the love of Jesus. Lord, help John as he uh, prepares and leads the church and give him joy in his studies. And we pray that he may have things to encourage him and to uh, strengthen his faith in you. Help bless Ruth and the family. Keep them close to you, Lord, and love in you and love in your word. Lord, we pray your blessing upon them. So, Lord, we pray for our children. We thank you for them and the young people. Lord, we thank you that uh, some have turned to you. But, Lord, there may be some still who have not yet turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps some have some rebellion in their hearts and do not want to hear of Jesus. Lord, soften, close uh, these hearts, we pray, and help the parents, Lord, to share the love of Jesus. May they have homes where... Jesus is talked about and loved and Lord be with the Sunday school teachers now as they explain the messages of the Bible to the children help even the little ones to be attentive and to listen well and we pray that the teachers may be encouraged in their work for you <coughs> pray these things in the precious name of Jesus amen
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a wise and wonderful God. We don't come to any idol, but we come to the living God, the one who is everywhere, who knows everything, who sees everything. And Lord, because of that, we know that we are so small. But we thank you that in our weakness and in our sin, you came through the Lord Jesus Christ to reveal yourself to us so that we might know something of you. And we thank you that the greatest thing we can do is to worship and adore such a wonderful being. We thank you, Lord, for your providence indeed and that you govern all our ways and you know all about us and you have marked out our path for us that we may arrive in heaven those who you want there, saved, sanctified and blessed. And Lord, we pray that as we learn the different lessons in life, as we go through trouble, we pray that we may learn by faith to rely on you and know that you are our heavenly Father and you care for us. We thank you, Lord, that the Lord Jesus is our brother and we have been lifted to this wonderful position in Christ. And so, O oh Lord, we pray that you'll help us to rejoice even when times are difficult. We pray, Lord, for those who are persecuted. We know there are so many who are in prison because they love you. And we pray for them, Lord, that you would give them all the grace that they need this day to survive and to go through the uh, very hot or very cold hours of the day in uncomfortable or even in tortured situations. Lord, we pray that as your gospel goes out in such countries, yet you will cause many to praise the Lord for the bold testimony of those who are martyred for your name. We pray for the television and radio programs that go out uh, hourly uh, and we pray that accidental and incidental tuning may happen so that people may discover the gospel. We pray for those who secretly listen in order to be fed spiritually and we pray that you'll bless them and encourage them and may they see that the word of God is living and true and meets their every need. We pray, Lord, for uh, ourselves that we may be like the Thessalonians and the Bereans, that we may search your scriptures and know that they hold the truth for life. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we may learn the wisdom of God through your word. We thank you that we have the wisdom of God in Christ Jesus dwelling in us. And we pray, therefore, that we may learn to live by faith relying on the wisdom of our Lord Jesus and on his word and not on our own strength. Guide us in these things, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to listen to your word and we pray that we may take it in this morning and obey it. We pray for John and Ruth in the uh, looking for uh, accommodation and we pray, Father, that the home will be secured efficiently and soon and that there will be no uh, problems in that. And it may not be a distraction as John seeks to minister during a time of move. Lord, we pray that all, in all these things you would be glorified and praised because you are good and you do all things well. And may we seek to follow you as we should. Hear our prayers and accept our thanks for your love towards us in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Now, now Lois is going to come up and she's going to read Acts chapter 17 for us. Today's reading is from Acts 17.
Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the scriptures to suffer he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some, of, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the, all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. <coughs> the brothers immediately <coughs> sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They, re they received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him <coughs> as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and, Tim for Silas and Tim Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and someone, and someone said, and some said, and some said, "What does this babbler wish to say?" Others said, "He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinity, divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection." And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, "May we know what this new teaching is that you are <coughs> presenting?" For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your, po as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like God or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. 
and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom who were always Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Great, thanks so much, Lois. Well, Mike has prayed that uh, God would speak to us through his word, so please do keep uh, that passage open as we work our way through it. Uh, And I wonder whether you're beginning to think the book of Acts is getting a bit repetitive. Because in our passage this week, we get the same themes coming up that we've seen time and time again, don't we? They go to a new uncharted place with new unexpected people, Uh, They preach the gospel, and they're violently opposed. And wonderfully, people are saved. It is repetitive, isn't it? But it's repetitive because we really need to hear this. And we need to hear it as much today as when it was originally written. Because we're seeing the same thing more and more in our own post-Christian society as it becomes increasingly hostile to God's word. And that's hard to ignore. Last week I mentioned the school uh, chaplain, uh, Dr. Randall, who uh, reported the uh, government, sorry, was reported by the school to the government's terrorist watchdog by the school for gently and graciously uh, presenting God's word. The case was very quickly closed by the police, but he was still sacked from his job. Maybe you hear news like this and you feel like shrinking back keeping quiet, hoping no one will ask you what you think, or worse, pretending you think something you don't. Well, that's what, what Acts is here to address. And so the question is, have we got it yet? Have we got it yet? Have we got the kind of confidence Luke wants us to have in the unstoppable gospel? You see, Acts is repetitive so that we will really get it, that we can have complete confidence to fearlessly proclaim the Bible's message about Jesus, our risen King, wherever he takes us, whoever he takes us to, and whatever the cost. Whether you find yourself in a university campus with lecturers who undermine God's word, or amongst friends or or colleagues who suggest it's intolerant or irrelevant, We'll know we've got the message of Acts when we are prepared in any situation, wherever there's an opportunity, to open our Bibles and tell anybody that we meet the gospel. So the missionary journey, it continues today into Greek territory, into uh, that is under Roman rule. And here we see Paul engage with a huge diversity of people from different cultures and religious backgrounds, all under the rule of the most powerful man in the world at this time, Caesar. Will the gospel prove to be unstoppable here? Our first scene is in Thessalonica, and and because there's a synagogue there, that is the first port of call for Paul and his team. Because as we've seen, that is their custom. Their custom is to go first to the Jews, which you might think by this point is a strange strategy, because every time that they've done this, they have faced severe opposition. So why would they risk going into this path of danger? They've been stoned and flogged and beaten every time they've been in the same scenario over the last few months. Their backs are probably still sore. They've just got out of prison. Wouldn't it be wise to keep a low profile here for a while, to to stay out of the way, out of anyone who's got a problem with them? But no, Paul is in the synagogue like a shot. And he goes back every Sabbath for the next three weeks. Why? In order to reason with them from the Scriptures, verse 2. Because God's people can be fearless because King Jesus reigns and his word is powerful. He has confidence to walk in to what might have felt like the lion's den with the scriptures in his hand, 
because his conviction is that every time God's word is opened, God himself is speaking. This is why it's always Paul's pattern to preach the word of God. The plumber has a wrench, the artist has a paintbrush, the surgeon has a scalpel, and Paul, the evangelist, the church planter, the disciple maker, has the scriptures, the very word of God, the most powerful tool in the world. Which is why it's the, it's, it's the one he gets out of his bag the most often. Because what else could compete? God's word is powerful, enlivened by the Spirit of God himself to convict and save and transform. And it's powerful to be used in every situation. Let's read from verse 2. And as we do, listen out for all the different ways that Paul ministers from the word of God. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded. He reasons, he explains, he proves, he proclaims, and he persuades. And I'm sure this isn't just preaching a monologue, like I'm doing now. There would have been dialogue and discussion as well in, in smaller groups, in, in one-to-one situations. We're told in verse 11 that daily he examined the scriptures with the Bereans. The method might have been different, but the message was always the same. Verse 3, Paul was explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. This is the content, the heart of Paul's teaching, to teach that Jesus is the crucified and risen Christ. The one the Jews have been waiting for. In fact, the whole world has been waiting for. We see Paul shows them from the Old Testament scriptures how Jesus has fulfilled God's plan, defeating death and rising again, and that he offers that victory to all who follow him. The King, the Christ has come, and his name is Jesus. And for those Jews and Gentiles whose eyes got open to see it, it was the most amazing and awesome news that they had ever heard. Not because of anything clever or impressive that Paul said or did, but simply because he opened the book whose author is the God of the whole universe. When people find out what I, what I do for a living, they often ask me, how do you decide what to say every week? And I assume they must think that on a Saturday I, I kind of sit down and I, I consider what I've maybe seen in the news or read in the paper, and then I dig into the pools of wisdom that I, that I have up here and I share the most profound thoughts that I have with you all Sunday, every Sunday rather. Now, clearly, they don't know me very well, or maybe they do know me, and that's the very reason that they're worried. They can't possibly imagine what I would possibly have to say every week. But thank goodness that that is not the case, and why it is so helpful to see Paul's model. Because Paul, who was almost certainly a more wise and learned man than most church leaders, he doesn't lean on his own wisdom. He turns to the Bible for God's wisdom. And he seeks to explain the scriptures to people over and over again. Because it's his conviction that God's word is where the power is. And once again, here in Thessalonica, it's proved true, as some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women, verse 4. What could possibly cause such a diverse group made up of traditional Jews, uh, indigenous Greeks, and wealthy women to be united in a group with these two Middle Eastern men. Only something as out of the world powerful as God's word. And what happens here in Thessalonica echoes what has happened in cities all the way back to Jerusalem as they've travelled with the gospel. 
And this moment is not, not like anything anyone has ever seen before. It's, extra extraord- it's extraordinary, extraordinary. Because, of course, as we have come to expect, there is opposition. And listen to what the jealous Jews and the angry mob shout as they drag those who've joined Paul before the authority. Verse 6. For they say that this man is turning the world upside down. And then they explain that they are saying, there is another king, verse 7, a king who's higher than Caesar, Jesus. And last time we saw that the opposition used slander. Do you remember that? They used slander to oppose Paul, Silas, and Luke. But this time, it's the truth they used to get them in trouble. But the irony is that in doing so, they themselves testify to that truth. Because they are reporting an eyewitness account of the spread of God's word throughout the Roman Empire and of a movement that would indeed turn the world upside down, changing the course of history forever. But they get one thing wrong. It isn't these men who are turning the world upside down. It's their king, Jesus, and his word. And so God's people can be fearless because King Jesus reigns and can preserve his church. There is indeed another king, the king of the whole earth. And the beautiful results of his powerful reign couldn't be more obvious against the backdrop of this jealous and evil mob who oppose it. Because the reign of Jesus turns the world upside down in a wonderful way. It unites completely unexpected people together in peace and love, harmony and equality. And one of the ways we, we, in which we see this is the gathering of men and women as equal members of this church body. Last week we saw uh, God lead Paul to seek out Lydia. And this week Luke continually draws attention to each time the, the gospel goes and people are saved, there are particular women into, that God brings in, in, in every place. And it would have been extraordinary in the culture of that day for people to see men and women being united treated as equals and partnering in such a way. As shocking as it was to see Greeks and Jews coming together united. So one of the results of the reign of Jesus is this beautiful unity and it's world-changing in a wonderful way. But in complete contrast, those who rise against God's church bring chaos uh, characterised by violence. The result of the evil actions of the mob here is to set the city in uproar, to divide, to the point that they end up driving the the disciples away. But for all their violence, they can't undo what King Jesus has achieved. We know from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, that he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica Thessalonica, uh, to see how the church is doing and that he is he is uh, comforted to find that they are indeed blossoming and growing in their faith, despite the opposition. You see, the fact that King Jesus reigns means that God's people can be fearless, even in the toughest of situations, because he is able to preserve and use his people to grow his church. And that means Paul won't give up. I don't know how the word of Jesus was passed on to you, But I know that in order for it to happen, someone had to face opposition somewhere along the line. In order for the gospel to reach me and you, to reach this country, many have had to suffer. There were even many who were martyred. And they were willing to do it because they believed Jesus reigned and it would be worth it. Are we willing to play our part, to make sure the gospel reaches the next generation, even if it means suffering. You see, there's a kind of viral nature to gospel ministry in the the 21st century uh, term. It it means, rather, it's meant to be received and then passed on, just like a viral thing goes, a meme goes viral. And this section of Acts gives us so many reasons for confidence to play our part. Now, if you remember, at the end of uh, our passage last week, which I didn't quite get to cover the last few verses of, we saw that God was in complete control of his mission, turning opposition into opportunities. 
But, and although Paul and Silas were actually delighted to be given opportunity to preach the gospel in prison, it doesn't mean it was right. It wasn't right that they were banged up for it. And Paul saw that exposing the injustice of, of their imprisonment without trial was necessary in order to help the furtherance of the gospel in Philippi. Those last few verses in uh, chapter 16, we see this. He, he boldly stands up to the magistrates for the sake of the church so that it can grow in the future. The magistrates, they could have got in a lot of trouble with the Romans for imprisoning Roman citizens without trial. And so not allowing their actions to go unchecked will make them think twice before they treat any more Christians like this. And I think this moment, at the end of chapter 16, it shows us that particularly when the law is on our side, as it generally is for us in our country, so I'm thinking, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, we should prayerfully and boldly use it to our advantage. I don't know if you read about the Finnish parliamentarian, I don't know quite how to pronounce her name, Parvi uh, Razanen. She's facing jail for posting a Bible verse on her Twitter, uh, personal Twitter account. Well, this is how she's responded. I will defend my right to confess my faith so that no one else will be deprived of their right to freedom of religion and speech. I hold on to the view that my expressions are legal and they should not be censored. I will not back down from my views. I will not be intimidated into hiding my faith. The more Christians keep silent on controversial themes, the narrower the space of freedom for speech. Now, it takes great wisdom to work out when to stand up for injustice in this way and when we should know that uh, there are also times when Paul actually, he doesn't stand up for his rights. In fact, we, we serve a king who laid down every right as he went to the cross for us. But what matters is, is that however we respond, we do so as those who fear a higher power. We, like Paul, trust in the risen king of all the earth who can use any means, even the laws of a godless ruler, to preserve his people and the unstoppable gospel. But back to verse 10 of chapter 17. And we see that leaving Thessalonica, it means, in fact new opportunities for Paul, and yet another reason for confidence in the face of opposition as we see that God's people can be fearless because King Jesus gives a hunger for his word to those he calls. We saw it last week, and now we see it again. King Jesus both closes and opens doors in order to take his gospel to exactly where he wants it to go. In this case, to some super keen Jews. We're told that the Jews in Berea are more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What an encouragement it must have been for Paul to arrive in his place and to find people who knew their scriptures and were excited to get into them, to explore them further. Their knowledge of the scriptures, it, it makes me think of uh, the way that many uh, in the more senior generations in our society, I don't think we're allowed to use the word term old anymore, but how many of our, our senior citizens, they grew up with the Bible. So to, to some extent, they, they know the scriptures. They were sung in assemblies. They were read out at school. And I remember sitting in the pub a few years back chatting about Christianity with uh, someone in, in my family, and they said to me, how can you be so confident that Jesus is the only way? And knowing that they knew a bit of their Bible, I, I quoted the famous bit of scripture where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And they responded, oh yeah, he does say that, doesn't he? God's word has been sown into them years ago and it was still there for them to remember. And so it is with these Jews that Paul has found in Berea. God has prepared their heart possibly for years. And now he has brought his gospel to them just at the right time. And along with them, once again, we see him gathering Greeks, both men and women. And I want to encourage you, if someone you know shows any interest in the word, any interest at all, that is very often the first signs of a hunger 
in them to know God. It's a great open door. Offer to read it with them. Meet with them regularly. Because God gives a hunger for his word in those that he wants to draw in. And when this happens again and again, it is world-changing. And those who notice this, who oppose it rather, they notice it and they don't like it. As we see that here in Berea, as the Thessalonian Jews arrive, they stir up trouble. They've travelled all the way, they've heard what they're doing and they want to sort them out, they want to stop them. But by now, having seen time and time again this happen, we have great confidence that this will just be another op- opportunity for the unstoppable gospel. And we will see again, God's people can be fearless because King Jesus reigns and he is able to turn opposition into opportunity. We're going to say the same thing we saw last week. Because now we see God moving Paul to the capital of Greece itself. And as Paul walks around Athens, he's quite clearly upset by what he finds. He's never been anywhere like this. As he wanders around with his tourist map and he goes to all the attractions, he's astounded by the number of idols. As Petronas, uh, a Roman courtier, wrote uh, back in these times, that it was easier to find a god than a man in Athens. So how does Paul respond? Is he overwhelmed? Is he afraid? Does he consider keeping a low profile? Not likely. Firstly, he goes to the synagogue and then to the marketplace. And as he stands in the middle of Athens, this philosophical, religious, and academic capital of the world, what does he do? He opens his Bible and he reasons from it with whoever turns up. And unsurprisingly, people are interested. It even catches the ear of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers only in Athens. And they are fascinated with this man who brings them something that they've never heard before about a God unlike any other. This is right up their street. So they take him to the Areopagus, to the centre of philosophy and debate, and they say, you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Isn't that a brilliant bit uh, of writing from Luke there? I don't know if that last sentence was kind of written with cynicism or excitement. But he sums up the feel of this place pretty well, doesn't he? And actually, there's a way in which it sounds pretty familiar, this place. We, too, live in a culture where people constantly crave hearing something new, some new explanation of how our world came to be, some new perspective on our identity and what it means to be human, some new pathway to happiness and fulfilment. And it can be very daunting. People refer to the studies of scientists to validate their points or to the works of intellectuals with lots of initials after their names or to experiences that no one's allowed to deny. And whilst our cities aren't full of statues and idols, these ideas function like religions. People look to them for sense and meaning. And the followers of these Ideas often require that people bow down to them like gods. And so, looking at how Paul responds as he heads into this daunting place with the greatest academics in the world, will he remain confident in King Jesus even here? Will he choose to use the scriptures to engage even with these people? And interestingly, many people, they they have argued from this passage that Paul takes a different strategy here. That this passage shows us that in order to reach such people, we need to be prepared to engage on a higher level. And so if we want to converse with the university lecturer, for example, we need to spend years getting to grips with the philosophy books they've read. Or if we want to engage with the issues or ethics of sexuality, we really need to research all the papers and become experts in the field. Or maybe if we want to engage with our, our, our ordinary Christian, um, non-Christian friends, we need to watch everything that they're watching so that we can be aware and understand our culture. And people both, uh, uh, mostly base this reasoning on the fact that Paul is able to quote from Greek poets, verse 28, and from what he says in verse 22, where he begins with engaging with the culture. 
But actually, if we look at what he says, it's really quite simple. It's not PhD-level stuff. He simply notes what he's seen as he's taken the open tour bus uh, ride around Athens. And actually, the poems he quotes are apparently popular poems that most people would know. They'd have been on the primary school syllabus. It's like quoting a line from Taylor Swift, or if you don't know who she is and have never heard any of her songs, Bob Dylan or someone like that. Because people simply refer to the obvious, sorry, because Paul simply refers to the obvious things that he observes about the people in Athens as he wanders around. And he just uses these observations as a stepping stone to get to the only thing that he knows has real power to reach them God's word. Even here, amongst world renowned scholars and academics, in the most, most cultured city in the world, it's God's word that is the tool Paul uses. It shows us that all we need in our locker is simply a Bible and a love for people and the power of the Spirit. Isn't that liberating? In other words, we just need to know our friends and our neighbours and to open our Bibles. And God will do the rest. I don't know if you've heard about uh, the Uncovered series. So um, UCCF produced, I meant to bring one with me, I completely forgot but these things called Luke Uncovered or John Uncovered. It's just a, a small little book that takes you through the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of John. It's, it's designed in, in five uh, different sessions to, to sit down with a friend and to read the Word. And it's amazing. The UCCF have been trying to do many things over the years to reach students. And this thing has seen more people converted than anything else. Just sitting down with your friends and reading the Bible. And the same is true today. The word of Jesus, the king, is where the power is. So Paul says, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So his observation, For all your religious seeking, you don't know God. And his solution, Let me proclaim his word to you. It's a bold thing to say in any religious or academic centre at any time in history. It's not very PC or tolerant in the 21st century idea of things. But it's not unkind. He's in fact being loving. He is disturbed by the emptiness of their religion. But he doesn't stop there. In love, he is moved to introduce them to the God who they seek. He says, let me tell you about the true God because I want you to know him. Do we have a similar response when we look at the empty religion of our culture? Or do we get stuck at being disturbed and worried? It's easy to be upset by people's idolatry, but that should cause us to draw closer in love rather than to move away. Because all we, all we see now, uh, because um, well, we want them to see and know the true God, don't we? And so Paul opens the Bible. And actually, he starts with a bit of plagiarism as he quotes from a sermon that he heard before he became Christian. Do you remember uh, back in Acts 7, where Stephen was being stoned? And Paul was stood there, and he was encouraging the mob to stone him. But as he stood there, he heard these words from Stephen that he now proclaims. And so now Paul opens that same scripture that God potentially first used to speak to him all those years ago. And he begins verse 24 by bringing them the timeless truth of God's word, that the one true God made the world and rules everything in it. Which means he is far too big to live in temples made by a man and the so-called gods that these uh, Athenians worship. It should be obvious that our ultimate explanation for life, the world and the whole universe cannot be smaller than us, in creating God in our own image, we end up with something that is smaller than a human, let alone a God. Paul sees the emptiness and foolishness of these people's religion. He created us, not us, him. And he sees that their idolatry is leading them further from God, not closer to him. You can't be friends with a statue. And so he quotes their own philosophers to help them see our desire, our internal desire to be near God. 
And it's the same in our culture. People go on pil- pilgrimage. They do good works. They, they, they seek out yoga, meditation. It's a desire to get closer to God. But it's empty. And Paul is fearless to challenge them, but more than that, to give them hope. And Paul says God is as great as verse 24, yet verse 25, he's actually not far from each one of us. That is the reality of the true God. He wants us to know him. He longs to draw close to us. And he determines the time and place of our existence in order that we might find him, verse 26. Google Earth style, as we saw last week. That is why he's brought Paul here, to bring them his word that they might find him. And this is a word for any who are listening today, who are yet to know and trust Jesus. It's no accident that you are here listening. This word of hope is for you. But also, there's a word of warning in verses 30 to 31. Because a day is coming when the one true God will judge the world through the person of his son, Jesus. And ignorance is no longer going to be an excuse because you've heard about him. And so as Paul points us to Jesus' judgment, he's also appealing to us to escape it. Paul is saying we must investigate Jesus. We must decide what we think because he's coming back. God has fixed the day. It's in heaven's calendar. And if you doubt it, just make sure you've examined the facts because Paul says the evidence is there for all to see in his resurrection. He has died and dealt with our sin and now he has risen again in victory and he wants us to join him in that victory. Now is the moment to repent and receive forgiveness, eternal life instead of judgment. Paul is willing to, both, to pass on both hope and the warning of God's word because he knows that eternity is at stake. And he's convinced that God's word is the tool. God's word is powerful. And whilst we see verse 32 that some in Uh, the arrogant disbelief of this Greco-Roman worldview, thought it was stupid, not all do. King Jesus is gathering his people, even in Athens. We're given the name of two of them, an academic Greek Dionysius and a woman named Damaris. Once again, the world is being turned upside down, and it's through God's word. That should encourage us, shouldn't it? to speak, to get God's word open as soon as we possibly can with our friends and family. And maybe today is the day that he's reached you with his word. If you've never trusted in Jesus, Jesus, maybe this will be the day when you bow the knee to the king of the whole earth and receive the offer of eternal life that he gives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we want to thank you so much for the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed it in your word. And Lord, we thank you that your word is powerful through the work of your spirit in hearts. Lord, we pray that this would give us great confidence, that we wouldn't fear opening your word with our friends and our family and whoever we come into contact with, Lord, because we can have confidence that it is powerful to save. Lord, help us to go out from here overspilling with the good news of Jesus, that we would want to give people hope and to warn them of the alternative, and that we would do that by pointing them to your word. Lord, help us to be bold, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have another song now, and then we're going to spend a time uh, in communion together.
We are going to spend some time in communion now. Communion is an act of remembrance, but it's also so much more than that. It's an ordinance of God's word that Jesus asked us to partake in regularly and one which he uses to minister to us. So let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and ask the Spirit to minister to us now, that he would cast our eyes on Jesus to make his truth real to us, to help us to respond to what we've heard from his word, his powerful word, this morning. Let's just take a moment to do that. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we spend time now remembering the great news of Jesus' death and resurrection in the act of communion, we do pray, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us. We pray that you'd remind us of the wonderful truths that we've heard this morning and you would feed them deep into our hearts. Amen. So communion is for anyone who loves the Lord Jesus as their personal Lord and Saviour. So if that is you this morning, you are welcome to partake and join with us in the Lord's Supper. If this isn't the case for you, then please do just pass the bread and, or, or just don't take the bread and wine as it, it's passed around to you and use this time to consider all that you've heard from God's word this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28 says this, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Let's take a moment to examine our hearts, to spend time before God, bringing to him all the ways 
that we failed to live for him this week and asking him for to, to forgive us. That is the joy of the gospel. And as we come to communion, we are reminded of that. So let's just spend a moment uh, in repentance, uh, in quiet. Father, once again, we are so sorry for the ways that this week we have not lived for you as we should have done. There are ways that uh, we have spoken and acted that have grieved you, and we are so sorry, Lord. We are sorry that we forget to uh, live as your people. We uh, turn so quickly back to the things of the flesh and of this world. But Lord, we thank you so much that as we come together uh, as your people, those who are forgiven in Christ, Lord, that you now see us despite all that we've done this week and all that we will do in the future, you see us as righteous, covered in Jesus' righteousness. And so we can come, we can feed on your body and your blood this morning, uh, and symbolically through the bread and the wine, and we praise you, Lord, that as we do so, we remember that we are forgiven and that we can know you and we can grow in our love of you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Nick and Nicola are going to bring around parcels of bread for for the group that you're sat in. Please do distribute that um, and uh, uh, eat the bread uh, as, as it comes to you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my body. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. The cup will come round now. Please hang on to that cup. And as a sign of our unity, that beautiful unity that we've seen as uh, a mixed group come together from all over the place, uh, as a sign of our unity, we'll drink that at the same time together.
Okay, as a sign of our unity in Christ's blood, let's drink together. Lord, we thank you so much that because of the blood of Christ spilt for us, we are united as your body, that we have the great hope of one day seeing you face to face. And Lord, we pray that this great hope would spill out from us this week as we go out as your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a final song, uh, and then we will head out uh, outside, as uh, Chris said. We'll try and split into two groups. I think that we're more than 30. We're definitely more than 30. So if some people can go one side of the table, some the other side of the table, grab a drink and hang around and uh, spend some time chatting together, that would be lovely.
may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. I'm sure Ian will... Hopefully do that. 